Hello, how's everybody doing today? This is Mickey. Today I'd like to present a video of what I'm calling the nine most uh, not so obvious tools that you have available to you in Lightroom. And these tools can simplify some things, it can speed up your workflow, and some of them actually give us a preview and what the photograph would look like if we do in fact use these tools. So let's jump right in and get these covered. The first thing is going to be our color profiles right here. And a lot of people that I talk to say they don't even use this. They just accept what is given to us, never realizing there is a whole list of different color profiles. And these color profiles give us a starting point to start processing our photograph. The list that we see here is our favorites list, all right? It's not the entire list, it's only our favorites. So if you wanted to use Adobe Landscape, you click on it and it makes the change. If you wanted to use Adobe Vivid, you click on it and it makes the change. But here's the secret tip. If you go over to the right, in these little four squares and click on it, it'll bring up little previews of what the same things were that were in the list. So this is our favorites list. And what's so good about this, all I have to do is ho hover over it and it shows us on our picture what it's going to look like if we use this profile right here. Black and white, landscape, adaptive color, Adobe neutral. Now not only do we have these nine favorites, we also have a whole bunch more. So Adobe Raw, these are profiles that Adobe gives you when you install Lightroom. Camera matching, these profiles are what come from your camera. When uh, Adobe loads in the photographs, it looks at the metadata and it looks at whatever uh, artistic settings that your camera has built in. Then it, it supplies those in Lightroom. So I use a Sony camera and I have all these artistic uh, settings I have on my camera. Well, Adobe brings those in so they're available to me as a color profile. And then we have adaptive profiles. You have a camera profile that you can load in. And then you have artistic profiles. All these are what uh, Adobe gives you when you buy and install Lightroom. Now the big thing that I like about profiles, it's a great starting point. And on some of these, especially like the adapter profiles, you get amount sliders. So if you like that profile, you can increase it or decrease the effects. See what kind of changes we get? Not all of them have the amount slider, but I find the artistic and the adaptive, they do. And it just makes it a whole lot easier to use them and use them to their full potential when you can use that amount slider along with the color profile. All right, tip, not so obvious tip number two is going to be white balance. Now we all know that our white balance is controlled with our sliders on, uh, over here under white balance. And that we can grab this dropper and pick a neutral color. And I'll say we'll pick uh, like right here. And here's a tip, uh, not tip two, but it's a tip for white balance. If you look at your RGB values, and if they're within two points of everything, of all of them, it's probably a pretty neutral point. So 92, 92, 90. They're all within two points and click on that and you'll get a good uh, white balance. But here's the thing that the real tip about this, when you have your color picker and you're sliding over anything to check to see if this is neutral, look over here in your navigator window and you will see a preview of what that color change is going to be. So if we pick something that's obvious, not neutral, you see the kind of color change we get? It's kind of a bluish tint. If we pick the green, we get more of a blue hue in there. If we pick the yellow, we get another blue. So when we find a neutral, you can see it gives us a very clean white balance. And click on that neutral color and it will straighten up your picture and you have a good white balance to start processing your photo. So tip number two is when you're trying to find that neutral color, look over here in your navigation window and that way you can see the changes of what your photograph will look like once you click on that neutral point. Okay, not so obvious tip number three, and that has to do with our basic panel and the use of the option key. It has two key things that you can do with it. As you make changes, and we'll pick a, a calibration. As we make changes with our calibration tool and we decide that that's just not good. You can hold your option key down or alt on a PC and it turns on the reset. So we can reset shadows, reset primary, reset green, reset uh, blue primary. And we can do that with just about any of these tools here. Hit the option key and we can reset the entire mixer. Now, 
You also have the ability to reset each individual one just by double clicking on it without using the option key. The option key kind of makes it more global. So when I press the option key now, you see it resets everything at once instead of singular. But here's the big thing, the big hidden trick when we're using this. Let's say we make changes with this and we like the way it looks, but we're not so sure we want to keep it. All right. So if you hold your option key down, it changes the eyeball to a slip clip on uh, a turn on turn off switch so we click on it and it turns it off release the option key and it keeps it off so now it's not in play anymore we don't lose the settings we still get to keep the settings but as much as we want to click on it you'll never get it to come back on it is turned off permanently until we hold the option key down and turn it back on so the big tip here is you can set any one of these settings in any one of these tabs. And if you just don't like the way it looks, but you're not sure that you want to get rid of it completely and reset it, hold the option key. And instead of hitting reset, hit the little on off switch, turn it off, release the option key, and it will stay off. And you can continue on without losing these settings that you spent time in adjusting. All right, let's move on to not so obvious tip number four, and that has to do with the targeted adjustment tool. And that targeted adjustment tool can be found in the tone curve, and it can be found in the color mixer. And how this works is that we'll start out with the color mixer. You have this targeted adjustment tool that you click on, and then you can hover over the color that you want to adjust, hold your mouse button down, and then you can drag up and drag down and you can make changes to that color that you've clicked on. And what makes this so special is the color mixer actually attacks one color at a time. We're looking at reds, we're looking at oranges, we're looking at yellows and greens, all right? Let me hold my option key down and reset everything. But as you know, every color on your photograph is not just green. There's some blue, some yellow, there's some red in there, and you just can't or you can, but it's really hard to find out what colors are really in play with every certain part of the picture. So if we look at the, this church tower here, we grab our target adjustment, we click and hold and drag up and down. You can see that it has orange and red in it. So it's making an adjustment to the colors that it finds in that area. The same way with this green. If we grab the green and move up and down, you can see there's some green and some yellow. So it's actually affecting all the colors that comprise that area that you're hovered over. Now you can do that with hue, you can do it with saturation, you can do it with luminance. Grab the target adjustment tool. Uh, we're looking at luminance. We'll go here to the clock tower. We'll drag up and drag back. So you can see it's changing the lumens values in red and orange, which makes it a lot more efficient than you trying to figure out how much red and how much orange do I need to adjust at one time. The next is in the tone curve. The tone curve throws a lot of people. They don't know exactly where on the tone curve they should be doing adjustments. So if you grab your target adjustment tool and pick a light area, let's say, hold your mouse button down and drag up, and drag down and it affects all that luminance areas from where you just uh, clicked on and you can see it made our mark right here if we pick the shadows like right here and click we now get a point in our shadows that we can add another point on our tone curve just to add a little more uh, contrast because that's basically what the tone curve is is controlling contrast in your photograph so it's just a good way to use a targeted adjustment to find those specific areas to make the changes that you want to make. All right, not so obvious tip number five. This is a real simple one. If you want to adjust the size of your tap, of your window panes here, uh, all you have to do is hover over and drag it out. And you can see it's not going much further than that. But if we hold our option key down and drag, we can make it much bigger. Now for these sliders, the the basic reason we want to make it bigger is that we have more control over our sliders when we have more room to move. So you get finer adjustments when you make the window bigger. And all you have to do is grab it and drag it back. You don't even have to hold the option key down and it brings it back to the normal size. Same thing over here. If you hold your option key down, you can drag this out. Let's say you wanted to see your navigation window bigger. So you can drag it out bigger with the option key. Gives you a much bigger navigation window. If we were going to look, remember looking at these profiles, so I can hover over this and see those changes there. 
and I can have, uh, use my white balance and start touching different areas so we can see how the white balance is affected uh, when we are making those changes. So just gives you more area to view either on the left or right pane. Okay, let's move on to not so obvious tip number six, and that has to do with our histogram. We all know this is a good representation of our luminance values across our lights and darks and our colors. But did you know that you can hover over each segment, whether it's you know from your darks to your lights, hold your mouse button down, and you will make changes just in that segment of the histogram, right? So here we're looking at midtones. We can move it left and right to change our midtones. And that way we don't have to start looking at all sliders here. We can just make our changes by sliding back and forth on the histogram. But you also have this secret tip. If you hold your option key down, and we go to like brights right here. You can see that as I move this back and forth, I can start to see where I have blowouts. Now we just have very small blowouts in this range. So let's go to our whites at the very end of the scale, hold our option key down. If we drag here, we can start to see any areas that are blowing out. So any color that you see in there, that's a blowout area. So hold your option key down or alt if you're on a PC and make the changes. Same way here on the, the back end uh, with our darks. If I move this back and forth, we can see where I'm starting to crush my darks. So we wanna back that off a little bit. Now crushing darks is not quite as bad as is blowing out your, your highlights. So that's not quite as critical. And then you have your midtones, and you can move it without the option key, or you can use the option key and slide it and see those areas in the midtones that are starting to bring out too much blah, whites, you know, where you're blowing them out, or too much on your darks, which really it's not blowing those out. So just a good way to use that option key to find uh, where the highlights and the darks are being crushed or blown out as you try to adjust the luminance values on your photograph. All right, now let's talk about not so obvious tip number seven, and that is sharpening. Sharpening is found in the develop module under details, and you can see we have all our sharpening controls here. If you hover over this little exclamation mark, it's gonna let you know that to use sharpening effectively, you need to be at 100% uh, magnification when you're applying the sharpening controls. Now let me give you a little tip about how we can move this in and out real quickly. We want to pick the zoom range that we want to work on and I like working at 200%. So you're just going to click on this little value here and go to 200% and then go back to fit. Now you've set your zoom in and zoom out parameters. And how you do that is just click on the area that you want to zoom into. So if I want to see this clock tower, I click here and it goes back to 200%. I click again and it goes back out to fit. Anywhere I click, that's where it's going to zoom in. So that's just a little shortcut to get you going as you start using your details. Now in the detail window, you have this little down arrow. I want you to turn that down and you'll get a little preview window here. And we can use this when we start using our sharpening controls too. So we can grab this little target here and place it wherever we want the preview window to display. So we'll select it right here. And now we can zoom in and out with our mouse button. And we can see the specific area that we're concentrating on as we apply our sharpening controls. So then you just start applying your sharpening controls and you can watch it in the big window. Move your radius and details to where you think it's about as sharp as you want to get it. Then of course we have our masking slider and this masks away the areas that we don't want the sharpening to be applied to. If we hold our option or alt key down and slide this, we can see the areas that are going to be sharpened. Now sharpening is just a control of contrast on the edges of items in your photograph. So anywhere there's white, that is where the contrast is going to make the sharpening appear. All right. So as we move this back and forth, here you can see the sharpening is going to be applied just about everywhere, and that's not what we want. We just want it on the edges of our object, so we move the masking control till we see just those white areas that we want to control our sharpening, and we're all set. So the two tips, you know, be sure you set your zoom value, so when you click between fit and zoom, you get to go to the exact area that you want, and your targeting tool We'll let you pick out just the area that you want in your preview window as you apply your sharpening values. 
All right, not so obvious tip number eight, and this has to do with generative remove. To get to those generative remove tools, you're gonna click the little eraser here. We're gonna click the remove eraser and use generative AI. And then we're going to use our brush here and define that area that we wanna remove. And when you do that, it's gonna put a red area around it. But if that's not what you want, you didn't want to cover that much, all you have to do is hold your option key down and it turns into an eraser and you can refine that a little better. Then you hit uh, remove and it'll take it away. But what you can also do now is hit your option key and it turns this into an eraser and you just want to draw around those areas that you just erased, uh, remove something and release and it brings it back. So the option key brings in the, the scissors icon so that you can erase that area that you use generative remove to bring it back and you can try again. Now this also works with the spot removal, uh, this little band-aid here. So we can go back and we can say, we'll use this tool to wipe this out. And as soon as you release, it automatically does the removal. But let's say I, I didn't want that. That's not the area I want it. Again, hold your option or alt key down. You get your scissors. You go over that area that you just removed and release and it undoes or uh, and brings this area back that you removed in the prior action. All right, let's talk about not so obvious tip number nine. Last one, we're almost done. And this has to do with a compare tool. Now we all know we can use the backslash key before after, before, and after. But you can also hit the Y key and that brings up the compare tool where we can split our screen. So here we can see we're looking at before and after, before and after here. And you can zoom in and move it around. This tool does not work like the tool that you find on some uh, products where you grab the center line and move it back and forth. You're actually grabbing the photograph itself and move it, moving it around. So this is before and after. You just move the photograph between these lines. Now you can hit this little icon here, it has the Y in it, and it'll do before and after, top and bottom, before and after, through the midline, like this. And we click it again, and it does left to right. And you can just click and move around, just like this. Like I said, you can't move the center line. All you can do is move the photograph and see exactly what you want to look at here on before and after. Once you see all the comparisons that you want to look at, you just click the Y key again to turn it off, or you can click the single photograph icon right here in the center. So there you have it, the, uh, the nine not so obvious tips and tools in Lightroom. I hope these help you out. They're, they're just really nice things to keep in the toolkit so that as you're processing, you can get things working a little quicker, a little simpler, and give you little previews of what your photograph's gonna look like when you're looking at your profiles for color and white balance. If anybody has any questions, please drop me a note. Be glad to help out. If you have any more tips, I love to hear them. Send me a note and uh, let me know your tip, and I'll add that to the list so next time I do one of these, we'll have more tips to offer. And as usual, I can't wait to talk to you all again soon.